see in your sermon outline. We're going to look at this verse in 1 Thessalonians 5. We're talking about what is emotionally healthy spirituality. That God not only wants us to be spiritual on the outside, He wants us to be healthy on the inside. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says, May God Himself, the God of peace. Are you glad He's a God of peace? May May He sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the one who calls you is faithful, and He will do it. Can you say, He will do it? He will do it. In other words, God doesn't just want you to, your soul, your spirit to go to heaven, but he wants you to be well in your body and well in your emotions, as well as well in your spirit. The whole person integrated in a life of worship. Sometimes we've met people who who are spiritual on the outside. They can quote a lot of scripture, but have you ever met someone like that? And you say, wow, they can quote a lot of scripture, but I don't want to be like them because they're grumpy. They're crabby. They, they have a lot of words on the outside, but they have a lot of baggage on the inside. They have resentment still. They still carry attitudes. They're agitated. There's a lot of stuff underneath, a lot of junk in the trunk. They're still in bondage, and God wants to free us. This other verse I will give you here is in Ephesians 4.22. It says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off the old self. Can you say put off the old self? Um, I remember we were cleaning out the closets for a garage sale and uh, this was way back. And I still had some bell bottoms, some stuff from the 70s. I would say, sure, maybe I ought to wear these again. She says, put off the old self. This doesn't fit you anymore. Amen. There's attitudes that were a part of your old self. How many know we don't want to watch old movies of what we used to be? We want to let all of the old go because behold, all things have become new. Put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, and be made new in the attitude of your mind. Literally, the word renew means to be upgraded. How many have ever had some kind of app or iPhone and you got it upgraded. Isn't that good? And it was kind of good before, but now it's awesome. Have you ever been there where, like I was on a a trip to Philippines and coach, and they said, sir, we're upgrading you to first class. Hallelujah. It's the same airplane, but now it's a whole new level. It's the same joy that you used to have, but now it's a joy that's fuller. It's the same wisdom, but now there's a greater clarity to it. You're, you're renewed. Your whole being is being made new continually in the Spirit. That's what he's saying is supposed to happen as we put off those old layers of things. This very week, I had a dream that was kind of interesting. And in, in the dream, the Lord wanted to offer me this beautiful new shirt and it was just a beautiful shirt. And he said, Dale, first you got to take off that dirty t-shirt. I had this dirty t-shirt on in the dream. And so I, I took off the t-shirt. You know what was weird? There was another t-shirt under that t-shirt. And he said, you got to take that one off too. And I took that one off. And then there was another t-shirt. There was like 35 t-shirts. And the Lord told me, Dale, there's more layers than you know right now. How many know some of those t-shirts can be remorse that we haven't let go of? They can be a lie that we believe. They can be a, a memory that we still allow to hold power in our life. A resentment that has not yet been healed. There are layers that God wants to take off of us so he can put the new self on us. This week, we've been seeing God do that as we've been talking about emotional healing. People are getting free. Last week, one lady came after the service, and she, she was weeping. The Spirit was on her. And, and she, she's been from out of town, but, but uh, my wife, Sharon, knew her, and she began to talk to her. And she says, I'm just weeping. I don't know what's going on. And, and so she began, Sharon began to talk a little more and asked her how her teaching, because she's a teacher, and she said, no, I'm not doing teaching anymore. And, and she got a little more of the story. She said, you know, I was a teacher, and this principal told me, you'll never make it as a teacher. 
you, you, you get too related to the kids. You're just never going to make it as a teacher. She said, I gave up teaching. I'm in real estate now. Nothing wrong with real estate. But she was called to be a teacher. And all of a sudden in that moment, the Holy Spirit shined his light and said, you believed a lie. And she knew she had believed a lie. And we just said, in Jesus' name, let go of that lie. God isn't saying to you that you can't be a teacher. And she received her destiny back right there. She was healed. Hallelujah. Another fella called me this week. This was a very cool thing. He said, I used to go to your church many years ago. We've moved to another city far away. And he said, I wanted to call you to thank you for your ministry. And that's pretty cool. That doesn't happen too often. You know, sometimes pastors, when the phone rings, they're, oh, no, what's next, you know? I uh, hope it's a telemarketer. No, not kidding. But, you know, someone, something bad happened or whatever. So this was a very pleasant uh, call. And he says, I just want to thank you. He says, you know, I was there, and, I, and we received a lot in the church, but I want you to know that when I was there, I was never quite ready to let go of everything to God. There were still areas that I wanted to be in control of. He said, one of those was, was in my giving. I was... I was always afraid. He says, I was a tipper, not a tither. He said, I was always afraid to really give because of uh, fear of, of finances and so forth. Because I want you to know, the other day, I got baptized in the Holy Spirit. He said, there's something that just broke in me. God has blessed me. And he says, I want to just call you to let you know I'm sending a check for the two years that I was there, a tithe on all the days I didn't tithe. Hallelujah. I got blessed by that one too. Amen. But all of a sudden, he got freed up in his giving. The Spirit just took that lid right off of his life. Stinginess just left him. And now he's moving in his destiny. God wants to do that in areas of our life that we still don't know. That's why David said in Psalm 139, 23, Search me, O God. See if there's still anxious thoughts in me. See if there's still lids on my potential. And heal me, Lord. Restore to me, he said. We talked about that last week. The word restore is like antique furniture. Bring my heart back to its original beauty. Restore my marriage to a place of tenderness and joy again. God, you are the restorer. You, you make the broken thing not only well again, but you bring out the image of God in it. So it once again looks like you made it to look. Would you do that, Lord, emotionally? Would you do that in my attitudes in every part of my life? One of the important ways he does this is by helping us to what we call here today, learn how to deal with what we feel. That's the title of this message. God wants to help us handle our emotions before they handle us. How to deal with what we feel. Becoming a person who's emotionally healthy means being a person who knows how to have all different kinds of emotions without those negative emotions having them. Who knows how to move when they have a difficult emotion, not from an emotion to the flesh, but from an emotion to the spirit. They know how to take a, a negative feeling and say, God, I'm not going to act negatively on what I feel, but I'm going to let you take the negative feeling and turn it into something positive. I'm going to take the fear of my circumstance and let you turn it into faith in your promises. I'm going to let you take the worry about my problem and turn it into peace in your presence. I'm going to let you take a spirit of heaviness. Have you ever woken up with a, a quote, spirit of heaviness? A, a really bad mood is a regular way to say that. Ever woke up and you just say, yuck. And uh, how many know when you wake up and you feel yuck, that can go one of two ways. If you turn to the flesh, you know, you get up, rah, and, you know, everybody starts running. The dog hides under the bed. The kids said, look at daddy, watch out, everybody. He's in one of those moods again. But the Bible says Jesus can turn the spirit of heaviness and give you a garment of praise. He can give you the oil of joy for a spirit of groaning and moaning. He can turn that emotion around if we'll let him take dominion, if we'll be spirit-controlled in our emotion instead of emotion-controlled. This is so important 
Because learning to handle emotions the right way can determine how blessed we are in life. It can also be something that if we let it can ruin our life. Rick Warren said that emotions are like mattresses. If we're on top of our emotions, we can rest. If our emotions are on top of us, they can suffocate us. Have you ever been just suffocated by a heaviness that you're not dealing well with? They come in all kinds of forms. You see, the enemy is constantly stirring up tornadoes of difficult feelings. Tornadoes of rejection. What did they mean by that? Did you see how they walked by you right now? They didn't even look at you. <laughs> um, tornadoes of discouragement. It's, a, it's no use. Nobody ever appreciates anything that you do. These things come sometimes like waves. They almost feel overwhelming. If we give in to them, they can lead to some disasters. Remember Moses. He felt angry. God had told him to speak to a rock and bring water out of it. But on that particular day, he had had one too many complaining Israelites come to his office. <laughs> and he was just flat ticked off. And so what did he do? He slammed the rock with his, with his uh, rod. He acted out of anger, and God said, because you did that, you're not going to go into the promised land. Because you became an anger-driven person, I can't take you where I want you to go. You see, God says in one place in Hebrews, don't take that anger and, and put it under the rug. Bring it to me so I can heal it. So you can move through anger into gentleness, into peacefulness and kindness. Have you ever known people make terrible decisions because they were emotion driven? I've had people come and I saw their life and they said, well, I got involved in this affair, got relationship with a wrong person. And, and when they were in it, they would say something like this. How can it be wrong when it feels so right? Have you ever had someone say that? Well, it can be wrong because it's stupid. It can be wrong because the word of God commands you do not be unequally yoked with those who are unbelievers. And yet, the emotion can drive you to make a life-altering decision. And God says, don't be, don't be ruled by those things, but be led by the Holy Spirit. The fact is, every day we can choose to be controlled by the Spirit instead of driven by our emotions. John, Jonathan Martinson said, feelings are much like waves. We can't stop them from coming but we can choose which ones to surf. I like that. You can surf the right waves today. Someone defined maturity as the ability to feel wrong, but still choose right. Isn't that a good definition of maturity? I feel wrong, but I choose to do right. I feel like complaining, but instead I choose that this is the day the Lord has made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. You see, I, I feel like I don't like that person at work anymore. But I choose to love my neighbor as myself. I feel like I want to just quit going to church. I want to just be selfish. But this, the Bible says, is don't forsake the fellowship of the saints together. I believe that God wants me to give even when I feel like being stingy. I choose to yield to the Spirit. For the Bible says, whoever is controlled by the Spirit, that leads them to life and peace. But to be led by the flesh or by negative emotions is death. So how do we choose this? You know, literally, someone says the, the, the success of our relationships, the success of our vocation, all depends on how we handle emotions. A few years ago, uh, Daniel Goleman wrote a book called Emotional Intelligence, a really good book. But one of the things he, he made a comment on I thought was, was brilliant. He said that people used to think your success depended mostly on your IQ, how smart you were. But all the studies now show that your success is twice as much dependent on what he calls your EQ, your emotional intelligence. Have you ever known somebody that was really smart, but you'd never want to work with them because they were impossible, right? And yet other people maybe have less talent but they are able to channel their emotions. They're able to be someone who knows how to have cheerfulness when cheerfulness is needed, knows how to be empathetic. 
those people inevitably get up get further in life people who know how to take the waves of family you know you better be emotionally healthy to have toddlers or teenagers I mean, it's just terrible to see emotionally immature parents who can't handle a little disorder and they're always uptight and the kids are always upset and nervous because they can't just learn to flow with patience and flow with gentleness and grace. You know, I I, I was thinking about my mom and my mom was someone that was like a magnet. People came to her and yet she never had a position. She never had, I, I tried to understand what was it about my mom that made her such an attractive woman. And I, I'm convinced now it was her emotional intelligence. She was someone who, whenever you talk to, she knew exactly, she just brought the right emotion to it. She was empathetic. She was gentle. She just, you just said, I just want to be around this person because the, the emotions coming through her were anointed of the Holy Spirit. I remember when she came to listen to one of my first sermons, and it was awful. It was one of the worst sermons you could ever hear. And, uh, and it was kind of funny because I knew I was going to talk to her. And my mom was such an encourager. But she also couldn't lie. So I wasn't sure what she was going to say. And I'll never forget. I come to her and I said, Mom, what do you think? And she just had this smile, but a smile that said, I feel your pain. I love you unconditionally. And she looked at me and she said, well, Dale, at least you showed up today. You know, <laughs> Hallelujah. And, and it just said, okay, I have peace. She just knew how to say, I can come. See, emotional intelligence is the ability to recognize one's own and other people's emotions and to differentiate between the feelings, label them appropriately, and use that emotional information to wisely guide your next conversation, your decision, or your behavior. In Hebrews chapter 4, I want you to look at that with me now. Hebrews 4 says literally this is the key to, being, uh, uh, to having victory emotionally. It is to know how to discern between your soul and your spirit. To know how to recognize your emotions as, as at the same time recognize the spirit and to submit those emotions appropriately. Let's read this together. This is in Hebrews 4, 11 through 13. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest. I love the fact that the Bible describes emotional health as rest. Jesus used that same language in Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. He says, come to me, I will give you rest. That word rest literally means soul harmony. It literally means to be completely at peace, even in the midst of the most stressful situations. My mom used to call it living in the eye of the hurricane, where all hell is breaking loose, but you're in the eye of it. You have a peace that passes understanding. You, you're, you're, you're trusting God's in control of this. You, you're at, at a complete place. And you're not fluctuating. You're not all over the map. You're, you're just at rest. You're okay. It is well with your soul. And he says, this is how you enter rest. He says, so that none of you will perish by following their example of disobedience. He's talking about the children of Israel the rest for the children of Israel was to enter the promised land. And yet, you remember what happened? They did not enter that rest. And that's what Hebrews 4 is talking about. And the reason is they let their soul dominate their spirit. They let the fear of what they saw overwhelm the faith of what God said. God said, I will be with you. God said, you're well able to overcome. But when they saw the giants, they let the fear of the giants overwhelm their faith they said we are like grasshoppers remember that they shrunk in fear and as a result they never entered into the promise of God he says don't be someone who lets fear dominate you who lets fear replace your faith or you'll never enter in to the emotional peace that God has for you and then he says well here's the key and we're going to talk about this in a minute the key is the word of God The key is learning to live by what God says instead of what you feel. Who God says you are, not what your feelings say you're not. So he says, here it is. The word of God is alive. Can you say alive? The word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. 
It penetrates even to the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges, or in the King James it says, it is the discerner, it is the sorter out of our thoughts and our attitudes of our heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. What he tells us, he says, if you want to have emotional victory, you have to understand the difference between your soul and spirit. I like to say it this way, the difference between how you feel and who you are in Christ. The most important thing about a Christian is not how they feel, it's who they are. It's who you are in Jesus Christ. When you know who you are and you stand in who you are, how you feel will fall in line. If you know your identity, you will have an ability to deal with your emotions. You see, people who are victorious emotionally refuse to let their feelings define them. They learn how to stand in who they are. We, we learn how to stand in who we are, and therefore we can handle how we feel. A person who, who walks in their identity can say, I may feel weak today but God is the strength of my life. They may feel worried, but they know Jesus is my peace. They may feel guilty and have the condemnation, but they know I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Here's my favorite one. They may feel like a mess, but they know they're a masterpiece. I've been saying that. Have you ever woke up and said, I feel like a mess today? But the Bible says you're a masterpiece. You're God's masterpiece, created unto good works. They can feel like I'm poor, but they say, I know that I'm blessed with all spiritual riches in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. They, they're like Abraham when he was 99 years old. He felt like he could never fulfill God's promise for his life. After all, he was 99 years old, and he didn't even have one child of his own with Sarah. But all of a sudden, God gave him his identity, and his identity was Abraham, which means the father of a multitude. And Abraham said, look, I don't feel like it's possible to have children, but today I declare I am Abraham. I'm a father of a multitude. I can just see Abraham by faith pushing an empty stroller down Jerusalem Avenue, whatever, saying, hallelujah, I'm a father of a million sons. And people are saying, weirdo, weirdo. But he's saying, I know my identity. My name is Abraham. My name is fruitful. My name is more the children than I'll ever see. My name is abundance. That's my identity. My identity defines me, not what I see defines me, not what I feel defines me. And whenever you get your identity right, the victory comes. And he saw the fruit of that faith. David is another person, one of the most successful people who ever lived. And the thing that made David successful is the Psalms, where David in the Psalms, every Psalm he wrote is how he turned his mourning into dancing, how he took his negative emotion and he turned it over to God so that God could fill it with the power of his Holy Spirit. David was constantly overwhelmed. And yet he anchored his emotions in God. In 1 Samuel 30, one day David and his men were out on a, on a raid. And when they got back, they found that the Amalekites had come and kidnapped their wives and children and burned all of their property to the ground. The other people that were with David fell apart. They, they went ballistic. They started screaming, throwing dirt in the air. In fact, they turned on David and threatened to kill David. It's all your fault, David. How many know that would be good time for David to have a meltdown? <laughs> good time to say, I'm freaking out now. It's my freak out day. And yet the Bible tells us what David did. In 1 Samuel 30, verse 6, it says, David encouraged himself in the Lord. David walked away from that situation full of emotion and he began to write these psalms. When wars come to the ends of earth, I'm going to be still now and know that he is God. I'm going to hide myself. I love this verse in Psalm 61, verses 1 and 3. This is one of the, of the prayers he prayed during one of the worst storms of his life. 
Hear my cry, O God. Listen to my prayer. From the ends of the earth I call to you. I call as my heart grows faint. Lead me to the rock. Can you say it with me? Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the foe. David is facing the most emotionally terrible crisis of his life. And you know what he says? I'm not going to react in my soul. I'm going to go into my spirit now. And I'm going to lean. I'm going to anchor in who God is. I'm going to encourage myself. A lot of people say, if I only had more encouragement in my life. And how many know we wish more people would encourage us? Man, if only my family would encourage me more. If only the pastor would encourage me more. If only, here's the thought, encourage yourself in the Lord. That's what David did. David said, I don't have any encouragers, but the word of God is my encouragement. I can speak the word of God over my life. I can encourage my soul. My grandmother used to tell the story. My, little, my dad, when he was a little boy, he used to always run. He was a mama's boy, and he would always run for encouragement. One day, mama wasn't there, and the sister saw him out there looking for mama. He's crying. He's crying. And finally, he, no, he realizes nobody's there, so he sits on the porch. He starts tapping his back, and he says, bless my little heart. Bless my little heart. He began to encourage him. This is what David would begin to do. He would begin to encourage himself. You see, if I was to describe what it means to be in the spirit instead of the soul, your spirit is like the basement and your soul is like the house. Right now, there's some tornadoes happening in Oklahoma and other places. One of the things that happens when tornadoes come, people are smart enough to realize, I better not run out and try to face a tornado without a covering. I would just be wiped out. If I tried to say, come on, tornado, I'd be doing that Dorothy Wizard of Oz thing or something. And so what they do is when the storm comes, they go into the storm cellar. And because of the strength of the rock, have you ever been in Carlsbad Caverns? It doesn't matter what the weather is like on the outside. It's always the same in the caverns. It's always the same in the spirit. I love that verse we read early that God is a God of peace. Aren't you glad that God never freaks out? Hallelujah. God never has a bad day. He never wakes up on the wrong side of the bed. Aren't you glad that you don't call up God and say, God, did you see the problem? And God said, yes, what am I going to do? Oh, my goodness, what am I going to do? Oh, myself, or whatever he says. God says, hey, I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. You may be faithless. I'm still faithful. My mercy is new every morning. I never change. I'm the end and I'm the beginning. I am for you. Who can be against you? Before the battle is fought, I'm already celebrating the victory because I've already written the end of the story. Before you suffer, I have the healing. Before there were sinners, he was the Savior. (laughs) Before we were lost, he already figured out how to find us. Before we were trapped in a temptation, he's already planned your escape. He is already in control of your life. I love what Sharon said a few weeks ago in the sermon. God is a no-drama God in a drama-driven world. (laughs) This world has so much drama, doesn't it? Every day is another turmoil. And God says, you don't have to get moved by those things. Be still and know that I'm God. I'm right here. One of the ways we do that is when we go into our spirit, see, our, our soul says, I feel this, I think this, but your spirit says, I know this, and I am this. Your soul is always saying, I doubt this, I wonder about this, I'm afraid of this, but your spirit is your real self, and your spirit says, I know God is in control. The people who have victory are people like Job when all of his life was falling apart. He didn't say, I think I'm going to make it. He said, I know my Redeemer lives. And in the end, I will see God. Paul said, I know. I know that he is able to finish that which he has brought the beginning to completion. 
He would say the same thing in the middle when he was facing jail. I don't know about jail. I don't know about shipwrecks. But I know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. I know. When you're in the storm, don't think about what you feel. Think about what you know. Well, I don't know if God's near. Well, I know that Jesus is the Savior of my life. In there you find strength and power. Hebrews writer tells us we need to recognize the difference between our soul and our spirit. Very simply, we are three parts. We have a body, we have a soul, but we are a spirit. We are spirit, soul, and body. The spirit of the man or woman is the real you. You see, these emotions aren't you. These emotions are like this shirt I'm wearing. Yes, I have this shirt on, but I'm not my shirt. I, I'm my, I am my skin, right? Your, your spirit is your skin and your emotions are your shirt. This is important to know. Because your spirit, when you came to Christ, was born again. This is huge. Your spirit contains the living God. <laughs> Your spirit is a new creation in Christ. You know, all those verses in the Bible that have in Christ by them. In Christ, you're holy. It's not talking about your body or your soul. It's talking about your spirit. Your spirit is blessed with all blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Your spirit is dead to sin, but alive unto God. Greater is he that lives in your spirit than he that lives in the world. Your spirit is like a branch to the vine. And if you bide in your spirit, you shall bear much fruit. Because your spirit is connected to the source of all life. Your spirit is connected to love that's poured out. That never stops flowing. Your spirit is connected to the God who says, I am your peace. I never change. Your spirit is who you really are. It never changes it, the day you were born again, you became the righteousness of God in your spirit. You became royalty in your spirit. You may look like a failure in your, in your flesh, but in your spirit, you are already reigning with Jesus Christ. You are already more than a conqueror. You are already in his presence. Faith is in your spirit. He's the author of faith in your spirit right now. He is the Lord who's healing your spirit. He is there. Paul said it this way. I am crucified with Christ in my spirit. It's no longer I who live. It's Christ who lives in me. Who am I? I am who Jesus is in me. I am bold. I am brave. I am strong. I am able. I am pure. I am capable. I am forgiven. Why is that important? Because the victory comes when we stand on the fact of what God, who God says we are in our spirit instead of being moved what our feelings say that we're not in the flesh. Our spirit doesn't change, but our soul fluctuates constantly. You see, in our soul realm, some days we're fearful, some days we're bold, some days we're happy, some days we're sad, some days we're compassionate, some days we're indifferent. Some days we're sure, some days we're confused. Isn't that true? Don't every one of us in our souls just go all over the place? You know, if I, if I lived in my soul, there's a bunch of people I would like and there was a bunch of people I wouldn't like. <laughs> of course, I like all of you. But, but because I don't live in my soul, it doesn't matter because the love of God is shed abroad in my heart. My heart is filled with his love. It doesn't matter what I like. Because I'm not my soul, my soul is what's tempted. My spirit isn't tempted. My soul has bad thoughts. My soul is constantly barraged. And if you don't know the difference, you can start repenting for your soul instead of rebuking the things that are coming at you from your soul. Jesus was tempted. Christians are tempted. Any given day, it's like every one of us are gonna have a barrage of these arrows flying through our minds, impure thoughts that try to land there. Martin Luther said, 
Impure thoughts are like birds that fly over our head. We can't stop them from flying over us, but we don't have to let them build a nest in our hair. <laughs> These emotions are going to come. You're going to feel offended. You're going to feel despairing. What do you do? You say, God, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Lead me to the nature that's different than the nature of my soul. How many know you have the very love nature of Jesus living in you? You're born by the word of God that says the very DNA of Jesus Christ lives in you. Your DNA is to be patient and kind. Your DNA endures suffering for a long time. That's who you are. How do we activate that? Well, this verse, we'll go to this verse again, verse of Hebrews 4.12. He says the key to all of it, the key to letting the spirit rule over the soul, the key to living in peace when there's fear all around you is to let the word of God be the thing that differentiates between your spirit and your emotions and your body. We enter into rest by believing the truth of God's word. I like to say, believe God's word no matter how beautiful it is. I mean, you know, sometimes God's word seems too beautiful to be true especially when it talks about you. It's the hardest thing to believe what God says about you because he thinks you're so awesome. <laughs> and I don't know a day that I ever understood God's love for me that I, that I don't react in my soul by saying, no, no way. Me, the apple of your eye. Me, your beloved son. Me, the one you dance over and sing over every day. Me. Come on, that's too beautiful to be true. Me with no condemnation. Me, holy and blameless, who you never see anything in but the beauty of your son, Jesus. Come on, Lord. It's too beautiful. And God says, you've got to believe this even when it seems too beautiful to be true. Because when you believe the fact of God's word over the feeling of your emotions... You let your spirit rule over your body. You let your spirit rule over your emotions. You allow the truth of God to heal and restore the motions of your heart. See, what Paul tells us, first of all, or whoever the Hebrews writer was, is that when it comes to the inner healing, he says, You've got to know that the Word of God is alive, that it's powerful, that it's sharper than any two-edged sword, that it's the Word of God that renews your mind. It's the Word of God that breaks old sin patterns. It's the sword of the Spirit that breaks every chain of fear. It's the sword of the Spirit that is more powerful than doubt. It's more powerful than the lies that you believed in your past. You will never be a whole person until the Word of God starts to dwell in you richly. You won't get healed by just talking about it. The Word of God has to be unleashed in your life. When it starts to sink in, this truth, the fact of God's word, it changes you from the inside out. The first thing he says about the word is that it's the sorter out of your life. It's the discerner. It discerns between the intents and the thoughts. I, I saw a coin machine where you could put all your quarters, nickels, pennies, and dimes, and it automatically sorted them out. Here's the dimes over here. Here's the nickels here. Here's the pennies here. And the Bible says the word of God, when you meditate it, when you read it, it starts to put in order your soul. It exposes because otherwise our emotions just create this cloudy gunk inside of us that we're confused. We don't know who we are. We're feeling all sorts of stuff. We got moods happening. We got offenses. We're just all this confused person but he says the word of God as it comes it starts to sort it says this is a lie this one is your destiny this is a silly emotion this is just a, just ignore that one this is your deliverance here this is Satan over here and this is the opinions of people ignore that they don't matter 
it starts to order your soul. A healthy soul is a well-ordered soul. You're a person who looks in and knows all your thoughts and says, well, this emotion is this, and this is this, and this is that, because the Word of God has discerned my heart. Some of you like to organize your shelves, but you've never let the Holy Spirit organize your soul. That's why one day you're this person, the next day you're that person. But it's time to let the Word of God come in and say, I want to set your soul in order. This is what you're to believe. This is who you are. This is the word of God to you today. And then when that comes, it starts to be creative. I love what it says. The word of God creates life. It creates. I like to say God's commandments create the very thing he commands us to do. When God said, let there be light, what was there? Light. Light. God's word separated. He spoke. It separated light from darkness. It separated land from water. It's that sword that comes. And anything the word of God touches come alive. One of the things they're finding out is our, about our brain is that our brain is actually still growing. That's good news for some of us. It's actually, when you think, it's actually creating new cells. And you know what happens when the word of God gets in your brain? It creates super cells in your brain. It creates a cell for peace that passes understanding. It creates a cell for forgiving those who offend you. It creates a cell for loving the unlovely. It creates a cell of compassion. It recreates your brain to be like Jesus Christ so that you have the mind of Jesus operating in you. It's alive. It's alive, and it's powerful. It can expose those chains. It, it's a light that comes on, those fears in your life. Someone described what fear is. Fear is F-E-A-R, false evidence appearing real. All the things you're fear, fearing, they are just lies. They just have not yet been exposed to the light of God. And when the light of God comes into that part of your soul, it's like turning the light on in an attic. You know, have you ever seen all the cockroaches run for cover? <laughs> when the light of God comes into dark places in your heart, demons freak out. They leave. Darkness just departs. And peace comes. I remember when I was a little kid, I had a dream of this hand, a boogeyman sticking his hand out from beside my bed. And so for three years, I would sleep on the far side of the bed, terrified every night. And one time, my daddy helped me. I said, you know, he said, why are you sleeping like that? That looks weird. He said, Dad, there's someone who sleeps under my bed. He sticks his hand up, and he's going to get me at night. So he said, come on, tonight we're going in, and we're going to climb under your bed. Ah! You know? And he took the flashlight and made me get under the bed. I said, it's not here. It's not here. That pronouncement of fear in your life that you're going to end up lonely and rejected, it's not real because Jesus said, I will never leave you or forsake you. That, that fear that says you're going to end up broken on the street, it's never going to happen because my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. The fear that you'll never succeed is a lie because you can do all things through Christ. His light comes. When his light comes to guilt, you pack up all these bills that, you, that tell you you owe this and you find out they've all been paid for. Jesus paid for those bills. There is therefore now no condemnation for you in Christ. When it comes into those feelings of being upset and rejected. I love what Psalm 119, 165 says. Suddenly great peace have they who love thy law and nothing shall offend them. When the word of God comes in, it makes you unoffendable. How many would like to be an unoffendable person? That people can come and be as rude as they want to and say, I'm sorry, but I became unoffendable. I don't even notice jerks anymore because... The word of God creates peace in me. It's bigger than all the rudeness in this entire world. 
I've been recreated because the word of God is alive. It's powerful. The Bible says that if we want to be whole, we need to speak the word to ourselves. Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching, admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart. What, why do we sing worship songs? Is it to hear our voice? No. We're singing the word of God. When you sing, oh, Lord, you'll never let go. You'll never let go. When we sing, his love never fails. You know what we're doing? We're speaking the word into our soul. We're healing our fears. I try to never stop singing, much to the dismay of some people around me, but I'm continually singing. Great is his faithfulness. I'm creating, I need a lot more super cells in my brain. (laughs) God is fighting for me. You don't know how much that creates. How much confidence When we speak the word, it's like signing a check to a new emotion. What we say becomes reality. When we speak negative feelings, I mean, no, that just reinforces the negative emotions of our life. But when we speak God's truth, it heals us. Today, God wants to restore deeply some of you in the resource recesses of your heart i want you just to bow your head with me in prayer would you ask the light of jesus to shine say god would your word come i've spoken it and would your word begin to sort out between soul and spirit would you begin to show hearts where where they've believed lies where they have been captive to fears that you don't want them to be held by anymore? Would you begin to release people from offenses that have dogged them for years, from mindsets that continually quench their potential? Would you come, Spirit of the living God,